Well, I want to begin this morning with a huge thank you to so many in this campus community that made the inauguration festivities such a huge success. Uh, all of the delegates and, and friends from far places that I spoke with uh, were greatly blessed to receive the hospitality of this campus last week. And uh, partly that's just the exceptional work uh, that workers in our physical plant and from the advancement department and other volunteers from staff, uh, all of their hard work. But I do want to take a few minutes to uh, just thank uh, many of you students who were involved in one way or another. Uh, thank you to Rachel Berlingame and Ryan Buchanan, who were on the inauguration committee and uh, represented all of you very well in that capacity. Thank you to all of you who were uh, hospitality volunteers at the uh, tents around campus. Uh, students from Arena Theater, the dramatic reading of scripture, which was amazing in uh, the uh, service on Friday afternoon. Uh, concert choir, men's glee club, women's chorale. Uh, what an amazing experience for us to be enfolded within that beautiful music as you lined uh, the walls of this, uh, this auditorium. Thank you to musicians from around campus who were playing in various places, uh, making beautiful music uh, for our enjoyment and in service to the Lord. Thank you to our artists who were involved in a couple of the portrait projects uh, involved with the inauguration. Uh, thank you to those who spoke in the video greeting, which was uh, shown during the inauguration itself. Thank you for those who helped on Friday night uh, with a dinner, uh, some playing music, some uh, entertaining children. We're grateful for your service. All of those who uh, were involved in the tailgate and staffing for the barbecue. Uh, thank you to the football team for winning on uh, Saturday night. <laughs> Uh, to our uh, inauguration dance team. I, I believe I'm the, uh, the first president actually to be danced into office at Wheaton College. Uh, so thank you to all of those people. Hopefully I haven't left anyone out. Uh, but thank you to all of you who were here uh, for the concert last Wednesday and particularly for the inauguration on Friday. Uh, I'm just very grateful. I, I made the request that you would make a point of coming. Uh, it was a wonderful representation of our student body. Thank you for dressing up uh, so many of you. Uh, I felt honored by that personally. So feel the love uh, this morning and the gratitude from me to all of you. Now, as, as you know, I, I want to spend this year encouraging you in the grace of God, transforming grace, I'm calling the series. And I spoke last time about the holy calling of that grace that calls us to life together in this campus community. I said something in that message that a number of people have asked me about, maybe because it's something that we tend to forget, or maybe because it's not the way that we usually think. I said, I didn't know of a campus anywhere in America that needed the gospel more than we do. When I said that, I didn't mean particularly, I didn't intend to imply that there aren't a lot of Christians on this campus, although, you know, of course, it wouldn't be surprising. Most Christian communities, in, in those communities, there are people who do not yet have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's one of our prayers for one another on this campus, that we would know Christ. What I mainly meant to say is that the gospel is for Christians every bit as much as it is for non-Christians. We never get to the place in the Christian life where we outgrow our need for the cross and for the empty tomb. One of my mentors in ministry likes to say it like this, the gospel is not just the way into the Christian life, but it is the way on in the Christian life. And the main reason we continue to need the gospel is because we continue to sin. And that's what I want to speak about this morning, the deep-seated sin that necessitates our salvation. To experience God's transforming grace, we need to understand its humbling necessity. And I want to show our need for grace and the way God answers that need with a familiar story from Luke 18. Let me uh, encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. Hopefully you have a Bible handy. Honestly. If, if I didn't have the Word of God, I would have nothing to say in chapel. So praise God, we have the Scriptures. This is a, a story, Luke 18. It's a story Jesus told to some who 
trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. In other words, it's a story for people who will not admit their need for grace. It's a story for us if we are too proud to confess our sins. Luke 18, let me begin reading at verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, the story really begins with a surprise because everyone in those days would know that tax collectors generally do not go to the temple, and they certainly don't go there to pray. Tax collectors were in the employ of the Roman government and thus were generally considered to be traitors to the cause of the Jewish people. Many practiced extortion. That was their reputation. One commentator tries to make a contemporary comparison. He compares them to drug pushers and pimps, people who prey on society, who use others, who make a living stealing from them. And so make no mistake, this tax collector was not a nice man. He was a crook. The Pharisee, by contrast, stood for everything in that society that was right and good. The Pharisees were the spiritual overachievers, theologically orthodox, morally devout. And maybe our respect for this particular Pharisee is increased when we overhear his prayer. Here's a man who comes before God with thanksgiving. He's not an extortioner. He's not an adulterer, so he says. Rather than taking money for himself the way a tax collector would, it, it's clear here's a man who gives his money away to others. He, he not only prays, but also fasts. In cultural terms, this man would be a pastor or a theologian, maybe a Christian college president, that sort of person. And yet, for all of his devotion, this Pharisee was not righteous in the sight of God. And his most obvious problem was spiritual pride. You'll notice he begins by addressing God, but he ends up talking an awful lot about himself. He gets just two short verses. He manages to mention himself five times. I do this, I do that, I do the other thing. It gets worse because if we translate the sentence more literally, it reads, the Pharisee standing prayed about himself or even prayed with himself, in which case he was not really talking to God at all, but merely having a conversation with himself, not truly asking God for anything or offering God any true praise, but simply reveling in his own sense of moral superiority. In other words, this man was exactly like the people to whom Jesus was telling the story. You look back at verse 9, it's a parable for people trusting in themselves that they are righteous. Here is a man, said Charles Spurgeon, who was too good to be saved. It's easy to see how self-righteous the Pharisee was. But, of course, what we really need to test is the same attitude in ourselves. How self-righteous are we? I can't emphasize to you strongly enough how spiritually dangerous it is to live and to work and to teach and to study on a campus like this one, where we have chapel three times a week, where we live by a community covenant, 
Do all of that and either you will go, grow strong in the grace of God or else you will become some of the biggest Pharisees in America. And so we need to ask ourselves, when am I like this Pharisee? When I care about my religious reputation more than I care about real holiness. When I look down on people who are not as committed to the cause of mercy or justice or ministry that I am committed to. When I look around campus and I say, whether I put it into words or not, thank God I am not a and then fill in the blank with whatever group on campus I happen to think is not as whatever it is as my group is. I'm a Pharisee when I am impressed with how much I am giving to God, how much of my time, how much of my money, how much of my talent, particularly compared to other people. When other people's sins seem worse to me than my own. When I can go all day or all week, or maybe even all month without confessing any particular sin. These are only some of the signs of Phariseeism. I could go on, but thank thankfully, there's a totally different way to pray. It's a way laid out for us very clearly in this parable. Really, it's a way that will save the sinful and hypocritical soul. Unlike the Pharisee, the tax collector did not count on his own merits. He was absolutely begging for all the mercy he could get. The scripture says that the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I look at this prayer, I notice three parts to it. God, the sinner, and the saving mercy that comes between them. A man starts with God. That's the place where all true prayer should begin. This is the first act of prayer. It's why we began our worship this morning with prayer, coming into the presence of God, coming before his majestic throne, worshiping him as the awesome and almighty God. When the tax collector did that, he couldn't even bring himself to lift his eyes to heaven. He could not lift his gaze to behold the, the bright and burning holiness of God. And so he began his prayer with God. He ended his prayer with himself, the sinner. I say the sinner because the Greek original uses the definite article. Not merely a sinner, but the sinner. Because as far as this man was concerned, he was the only sinner that mattered. And rather than comparing himself with others or putting himself in a general class, he was measuring himself against the perfect standard of a, of a holy God. And by that standard, he saw himself for what he was, nothing more and nothing less than a guilty sinner before a holy God. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, if my sinfulness appears to me to be in any way smaller or less detestable in comparison with the sins of others, I am still not recognizing my sinfulness at all. A good way to recognize that and acknowledge it is to identify ourselves as the sinner when we pray, as if we were the biggest, most obvious sinner in our apartment or on our floor or in our major or on the whole campus. It's me, Lord. You know the one, the sinner. That's the way that this man prays. But now that brings us to what, for me, may be the most striking feature of the tax collector's prayer, that in between God's holiness and his own sinfulness, he inserts a prayer for mercy. And this Greek verb here translated have mercy or be merciful basically means to atone for sin by means of a blood sacrifice. To understand this, we perhaps need to go back to the Old Testament, particularly to Leviticus 16, although that's not the only place. But if you know the regulations pertaining to the Day of Atonement, you know that once a year the high priest would make atonement for the people's sin. He would take a perfect male goat, 
And he would sacrifice it as a sin offering. And then he would carry the blood of that sacrifice into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place in the temple, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Now, what did this signify? Well, the goat itself represented God's sinful people in a symbolical way. Their sins, by the, the laying on of the hands of the priests, their sins were transferred or imputed to that animal. And then having been charged with that sin, the animal was put to death. The, the wages of sin were carried out. That goat was a substitute dying in the place of sinners. And once that sacrifice had been offered, the, the animal's blood now became the proof that atonement had been made for sin. God really had carried out his death penalty against sin. And so the priest carefully took that blood and he sprinkled it on what was called the mercy seat. It was the, the atonement cover, the, the lid to the sacred ark of the covenant. And you may remember that that ark was located in the innermost sanctum. It was in the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. On top of the ark, above the mercy seat, there were golden cherubim. And that was a, a symbolical reference to the very throne of God. It signified God's presence. He is enthroned above the cherubim. That was the, the earthly location of his holy divine presence. And then inside the ark, beneath the mercy seat, was the law of God, that covenant which the people in their sin had broken. And so sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat was a way to show that this atoning sacrifice had come between a holy God and his sinful people in order to provide a covering for their sin. Now they were saved. They were protected from the wrath of a holy God. And do you see that in the very language of the tax collector's prayer, he is praying for this to be done for him. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. He's asking for the blood atonement. He's using mercy seat vocabulary to ask for the atonement for his sin. And remember, the tax collector was praying in the very temple where those sacrifices were offered. In fact, when... Jesus says that two men went up into the temple to pray. It's generally taken to mean that they were there around 3 o'clock in the afternoon when the crowds generally would gather for attendance at the daily afternoon sacrifice. Knowing that he was under God's judgment because of his sin, he was feeling the weight of all of that. The only thing that the tax collector could do was ask for mercy to come between his guilt and God's wrath. And so he prayed for God to be mercy seated to him. This is what the Greek, Greek verb refers to. He's asking for the atonement for his sins. He's asking for his guilt to be covered, that he would be protected from the judgment of God. And you see, the order of the prayer is significant because it's a kind of echo of that Old Testament pattern for sacrifice. God, be mercy seated to me, the sinner. First comes God, perfect in his holiness. Last comes the sinner, deserving to die. But in between, the sacrificial blood that saves his sinful soul. And what I want to do this morning is simply commend this prayer to you. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. God, be mercy seated to me, the sinner. In fact, not counting, I suppose, the Lord's Prayer, this is the prayer that I offer more than any other prayer in the Bible by far. It's short. It's easy to remember. It's a good prayer to offer the first thing in the morning. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I, I want to live under your mercy in the following day. It's a good prayer to offer at the end of the day, particularly with all the things that have happened and the sins that need to be confessed. God, I ask it again, be merciful to me, the sinner. It's a prayer I often offer before coming to preach the Word of God. It's certainly a prayer to offer when we are weighed down by the guilt of our sin. Maybe there's a person like that in this sanctuary this morning. You feel troubled in conscience by a sin that you know that needs to be confessed. Here's the prayer for you. For you. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I, I don't hide it. I don't conceal it. I bring it before you. I ask for your mercy.
And when we pray this way, what we are really doing is praying the gospel. The misery of the sinner and the mercy of God, I'm quoting from Bonhoeffer again, this is the truth of the gospel in Jesus Christ. You put those two things together, the misery of the sinner conscious of sin and the mercy of God is demonstrated in Christ. This is the truth of the gospel for us in Jesus. By offering his blood, Jesus Christ has become the atoning sacrifice for our sins. His death is our substitute. His cross is our mercy seat. His blood is the salvation of our souls. To say that Jesus died for our sins, as the scripture says again and again, it's really to say that his sacrifice accomplished what that blood on the mercy seat accomplished. Like the sacrificial animals of the Old Testament, Jesus died in our place. Our sins were transferred or imputed to him. Peter says it like this, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And as a result, our sins are covered. Our, our guilt is taken away. As the scripture says, Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And his blood now becomes the proof that atonement has been made for sin. For us, the mercy seat is the cross. That's the place where atoning blood was, was sprinkled for our salvation. In fact, to explain what Jesus was doing on the cross, the New Testament often, uh, maybe I shouldn't say often, I should say sometimes, uses the, the noun form of the same verb for mercy that we find in Luke 18. You find it, for example, in Romans chapter 3, verse 25. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement, its mercy seat vocabulary. Again, Hebrews chapter 2, Jesus is described as a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God who has made atonement for the sins of the people. And of course, the extraordinary thing about Jesus as high priest is that he does not simply bring a sacrifice, he becomes one. John writes the same way in his first epistle. He talks about this atoning sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's mercy seat vocabulary. It assures us that our plea for mercy will be answered. And so when, when I come before God, when you come before God and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner, we are making an appeal to the cross that the blood of Jesus would cover all our sins. Are you able to say this morning that God has been mercy seated to you? What compels me to ask that question is the way the parable ends. Two men, we are told, went to the temple. They offered, we have seen, two very different prayers. The result in the end is they met two very different destinies. In the end, the tax collector got what he asked for. His prayers were answered. God was mercy seated to him. And so Jesus closed his story by saying that this man and not the other was justified. He was justified by the mercy of God on the basis of the atoning blood of a perfect sacrifice, which he asked to receive in a prayer uttered in faith. But God did not justify the Pharisee who worked so hard to justify himself. And I have to tell you, this would have been a total shock to anyone listening to the story. And so I think that's the reason Jesus is very specific about it. He specifically says that this man was not justified. He, he had declared his own righteousness, but he was never declared righteous by God. And so when the man went home, he was still unjustified. In fact, his righteousness really was part of the problem. He was too busy being self-righteous to receive God's righteousness, which can only come as a gift. If you look again at the Pharisee's prayer, you see it's all about what he can do for God. I thank, I am, I give. It's all active verbs in the first person singular. What made the tax collector's prayer so different is that he was asking God to do something for him, and the only verb in his prayer is a passive verb, not something he does, but something he is asking to be done for him. It's a prayer offered as well in the second person, God, be mercy, mercy seated to me, the sinner. God 
Be merciful to me, the sinner. Pray that way, and you will be justified. And what is more, you will be so humbled by your own desperate need for grace that you will have no need to look down on anyone, but instead will live with the joy and the gratitude and the humility that only grace compels. Our Father, we pray for this kind of grace to be worked out in our own lives. We pray it corporately. God, be merciful to us, the sinners. We would not hide it or conceal it, but we would confess it. And we, we pray it personally in repentance and faith. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. And as we pray, we do pray in faith, believing that you have been mercy seated to us through the cross. We praise you for Jesus. We praise you for his sacrifice. We praise you for his blood. We praise you for the forgiveness that is ours in him. And we pray that by the Spirit, we would live in the humility and joy that your grace compels. We pray this in Jesus' name. And will you please stand for a benediction? What a joy it is for me to bless you in the Lord's name. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ transform your mind. And may the love of God the Father fill your heart so that in the power of the Holy Spirit, you may go out to serve a world in need. Amen.